almost there, guys. All right. Welcome, welcome everybody that is live with us here on Zoom and live now also on our Facebook feed. And uh, like I was mentioning before, um, happy that I have everybody here on board tonight. I know it's a very impromptu last second thing to put this class out tonight on a Monday night, uh, but uh, due to the circumstances and tomorrow night, we are giving out the class tonight. Now, um, I just want to, first of all, let everybody know that right after myself, there will be a class by Sharon Lankry in the same room starting at 9 p.m. So this class hopefully will get to the end on time so we can have the next class that comes right after me. Uh, so if you guys are going to be uh, sticking around, I highly recommend you do. Sharon Lankry is an incredible teacher, um, very inspiring. So for those that are here, feel free to stay on for that as well. Now, for that being said, let me put on the main screen here so we can get the Likute Mohoran back in action. And we got this right here. And I'm going to mute everybody. And we are ready to rock and roll. Okay. Cool. All right, guys. So let's discuss a little bit of what we're talking about, where we're at. The main goal here, as we spoke about from the beginning of this class, is do you want to taste the Orhaga news? The Orhaga news, as we spoke about, is this light, um, the beginning of light that was originally in Breshi. Um, but it's a light that essentially, Rabbi Nachman says, is something that we're all going to receive when the time Mashiach comes. And we're going to experience this light. And the next thing that Rabbi Nachman said was, he said, well, guess what, guys? You guys want to experience it? You don't have to wait till Alam Haba. You can actually achieve this and, and experience this Orha Ganus, this, this hidden light here right now in this world and have an aspect of that and taste that. So he said this idea of the concept of trying to raise fear back up to its source. And he says through Da'a, through knowledge, we can ascend up to the source, which is Bina, which is the heart. So Rabbi Nachman went on through uh, quite an extensive amount of different ideas and concepts relating to that idea and concept of what does it mean to raise fear, irat shamayim, all these different things. And then we spoke about the idea that once a person has uh, prayer done correctly by how do you do that? How do you raise your fear? By doing he to do it, by doing personal uh, judgment on yourself. And when a person judges himself in this world, then you don't get judged above in shamayim. And when a person essentially is doing judgment and doing he both to do with Hashem every single day, then all of a sudden, all of a sudden probably takes some time, right? But the idea here is that once we get to these points, essentially the revealed Torah is revealed to you. And then therefore you can now pray properly. And if you're praying properly, essentially Hashem will reveal to you from the revealed Torah, you'll get the hidden secrets of the Torah. And those in those hidden secrets, that's where we find this Or Haganus that a person experiences. So now we're in the middle of the whole chapter uh, discussing, as usual, the famous stories of Rabbi Babarhana that are found in the Gemara. And we were right smack in the middle of one of the stories. Uh, just to quickly uh, touch base on that, we spoke about the idea, just quickly to go through the story, Rabbi Babarhana, he saw this Akrukta which was the size of a hagrunia. Now, what was an akrukta? We spoke about the akrukta being a frog. In frog, we say in Hebrew, it's a tsfardeya. A tsfardeya, if you break up the word tsfardeya, it's tsipor deya. Tsipor was the concept of the bird. Deya was the concept of knowledge. Then we spoke about the city of, of Hagrunia, how large was the city. We spoke about the 60 homes, 60 houses. 60 houses represented Abraham Avinu, the 60 kingdoms, the concept of kindness, how Hashem is so kind to us that he gives us an opportunity that we can actually pray to Hashem with uh, concepts like Hagadol, Hagibor, Behanara. Like we can't even fathom what it is to really pray to Hashem and understand his greatness. But God gives us this ability to. And God likes that. He enjoys the fact that we can actually pray to him. 
And that's his kindness for us. He's, there's no word to describe him. And yet at the same time, he gives us that opportunity. And we spoke about a lot of these ideas with the houses and all that stuff. And now we came up to this part about the Tanina. So we are now right here. The Ata Tanina Bella. Okay. For those that have the book with them, we are on page 356, 357 in chapter 15, section 5. So now he says, Rabbi Nachman says in the story, Ve'ata tanina bala'a. A tanina came by and swallowed it. It swallowed this frog that was the size of these 60 houses. It must have been a really big frog, right? Tanina zebechinat nach. And a tanina indicates this aspect of a serpent. This serpent, it lures a person into praying for personal benefit. Such as give us life and livelihood or other similar benefits. Look at number 40 on the bottom to explain what that means. So what Rabbi Nachman teaches that with a person's humility, a person needs to nullify his physical desires so that he can attain, attain the level of prayer where he completely, as we spoke about earlier in this chapter, sheds his garment. For one acquires Torah, he merits prayer. But during this prayer, he has to detach himself entirely from corporal reality. Now, As we're going to keep going in the next part, you have to know that this idea we spoke about earlier, that spirituality, if you want to really taste this or news, you want to experience high levels of spirituality. When spirituality goes up, materialism goes down. That's the formula here. Not easy, tough, because some people are like, I want both, right? Like I want to be high level spiritually. And also let's say, very much to an, extent, to an extent in materialistic world, but that's not the formula. And in this case, the person needed to be praying to Hashem, the Nachash, the serpent, which represents, represents klipa, it represents materialistic desire, sexual desire, the serpent, right? It represents that the person's praying, what is he praying for? He's praying for all materialistic things, livelihood, life, whatever. But is he really praying for spirituality? Are you only praying to be close to Hashem? We spoke about last week about the different things that a person can be praying for, to be zoche for, to have the merit for, right? So that's what the, this, the serpent came by and swallowed it. That's what the serpent means. The story continues as we go to number seven. The ate pushkana ubala. And then a pushkanza came by and swallowed it, swallowed this snake. Perash Rabbeinu Shmuel. So Rabbeinu Shmuel explains this pushkanza. What is a pushkanza? Rabbeinu Shmuel, he says, this is an orev. An orev is a raven. The Amruz, hachameinu zichrono levracha. And this is what our sages taught in Masechet and Reuben in the Gemara. Misha mashchir panav ke orev, umi, with whom is the Torah to be found? Who is the one who's got that Torah in him? With the one who makes his face as black as a raven. And one, sorry, excuse me. And one who makes himself cruel to his children as the raven. This is a tough one, guys. I'm going to go through it. I'll explain it to the best of my ability. It's tough. I'm going to explain to you what this means. The Eino Choshev the Klum and Atmo. That is, he prays without any concern for personal benefit. The Eino Choshev the Klum and Atmo. And he doesn't consider himself as having any worth. And that, so that all his selfhood and corporal realities, materialism, is completely, completely eliminated. And he's so completely negated, completely off this world, out of this world. He's nothing. But there's a Pasuk in Tehillim that says, As it's written in Tehillim, For your sake, we are killed each day. 
So we look at number 41 of the notes. What's the story with this raven, this Pushkansa? What does it represent? So it says you the raven is known to be a very cruel bird, even to its own offspring, even to its own children. Like the raven who would dedicate himself to coming closer to God so that he might experience his organ haganus, he needs to be totally unmerciful towards his own selfhood and corporeality. When praying, he has to negate all his physical interests and focus only on the spiritual needs of his soul. Only through this cruelty, quote unquote, can one merit insight into the hidden Torah. The raven is, an, is a bird that is cruel to his children. What does that mean? It means normally the children, let's look at children as your physical desires and physical needs, AKA, keep it simple. I need to pray for Parnassa to provide for myself and for my family, AKA my children, Parnassa livelihood, right? So what he's saying here is this person is all out into the spiritual. I'm only praying for my spiritual. I'm trying to get rid of the materialistic and I'm only focusing on the spiritual. That's what the raven now represents. He gives you a pasuk from right after that. And he says, for your sake, we are killed each day. What does that mean, that pasuk? Number 42, it says, Rabbi Nachman explains that a day does not go by. Without, and I think everybody can relate with this. With, that, with each, each and every person displaying some sort of mesirat nefesh. Mesirat nefesh means complete self-sacrifice. People give of themselves for someone or something in many different ways. The ultimately perfected self-sacrifice, this whole idea of self-sacrifice that we do for this person, that one, it's at the end of the day is that we need to have self-sacrifice for Hashem, for God. The messy rat nefesh, the self-sacrifice is referred to in the Pasuk when it says, for your sake, we are killed each day. This can be better understood in light of this lesson because it is during prayer, during this intense prayer that a person is praying to Hashem, one has to kill, so to speak, all his selfhood and sacrifice material benefit for God. Not easy, guys. I, I want to say this. This is high level service to Hashem. Most people will not be able to do this. I want to make this clear. But as I mentioned in many classes beforehand, Rabbi Nachman is a high level tzaddik. But he will not short sell you. He's going to tell it to you as it is. And hey, you know what? You can do this too. Okay. Continuing, it also says in the notes, Rabbi Nachman says, when people want to become truly, truly, truly religious and serve God, what happens to them? Right? This is a very common thing. A person becomes a Baal Tshuva and he's all excited and he's on fire. And then all of a sudden, boom, here come the difficulties. Here come the challenges. Life is not so rosy anymore, right? This is a common thing. All the enthusiasm that such people have when they're trying to do good is very precious, even if their goal is not achieved. I wanted to dive into God three times a day. I wanted to learn to Torah at least an hour a day. I wanted to be able to wake up, high-level stuff. I wanted to wake up for Tikkun Hatzot in the middle of the night. I want to, God. I have Ratzon. I have a will. I didn't do it. I fell flat. I just, uh, the kids didn't let me. Whatever, work, all the different things that stop you, that prevent you. God knows in your, what's in your heart. He knows that, and he appreciates that, and he loves that. He all loves your Ratzon. That effort, so it says here, all their effort is counted, even though you didn't achieve it, all their effort is counted like a sacrifice in the category, as we spoke about this famous Pasuk, for your sake, we are killed each day. This verse also applies to the person who wants to pray, but encounters numerous distractions. If he gives himself over entirely to the task, exerting every effort to pray properly, then even if his prayer is not perfect, his very effort is like bringing a sacrifice. We have to look at our service to Hashem at all different fronts and all different levels like a sacrifice. And that's legit because we experience these every day. If, we are, if our mind is on the prize, which is really our connection to Hashem, and things get in the way, 
right? God knows you're trying. God knows you want. You know what I'm saying? Like, that's amazing for him. And that's that idea of that puzzle, what it, of it means. For your sake, we are killed each day. We are doing sacrifices. He continues, and the last part of it says, and this corresponds to another part we say in Shira Shirim, Shlomo Amalek's famous, famous prayer, Torah poem. He says, Shechorot Ke'orev. So now we find another allusion to this Orev. Shechorot Ke'orev, which means in English, black as a raven. What is that all about? This is amazing. This is beautiful, guys. This idea of Shechorot Ke'orev, black as a raven, the Talmud, the Gemara teaches that the Torah resides. It's only, we spoke about this earlier. The Torah is only with one who rises early and stays late to study or with one who shows no mercy for his physical, physical well-being so that he, so to speak, he blackens himself with self-abnegation in order to dedicate himself to Torah study. First of all, that's high level stuff, right? That's a person waking up early in the morning, before sunrise, he's davening nates, he's learning Torah all day long, he stays till the night, he's learning at night, he's learning till late at night, you know, the guy's exhausted, but he's trying, he's immersing, he's all in, he's all into the Torah. This idea is deduced from the expression itself. Let's look at the expression. The expression is, look at, look at this right here. Shechorot ke'orev. What words do we find here? This is so beautiful, guys. Shechorot has the word shacharit. Shacharit is the morning prayer. Ke'orev has the word erev. Erev means evening the person who arrives at the house to study early morning and he stays late into the night, enduring physical hardships in order to develop himself spiritually, he's going to find a blessing in his studies. He's going to merit tasting that hidden Torah, that hidden light in all the laws. In addition, Shecharot Ke'orev alludes to this concept of sacrifice and prayer. Rising in the morning represents the morning prayers and staying in the evening refers to the evening prayers. And that's a very high level, again, a high level service to Hashem, right? I remember, I remember uh, uh, just uh, for, uh, for, for fun, I'll throw this on the side if anybody's ever seen the, the, the show. Shtisel is a show called Shtisel. And one of the characters is a young guy, he's a young booker. And he's literally, you see the guy, he's just learning all, night long, all, all day long, all night long. He's just looking at his book all day long and he's falling asleep and he literally takes a match and he goes like this, and he, so to speak, almost burns himself just to like stay up and learn. And that is what we're talking about. This idea of black as a raven, a person who is all immersed, all in, into all spirituality. This is what Rabbi Nachman is saying, is how you're going to start being able to get this Or Haganut, high level stuff. I just want to make that clear. It's not for everyone. The story continues, and he says, And then it ascended a tree and he sat there. This, this Pushkansa, this raven, went on a tree and he just sat there. This is the concept of meriting the aspect of the hidden Torah. As it's written, there's a Pasuk in Tehillim that says, Moshe Katuv, Yashet Choshech Sitro. He made darkness. Sitro, his hidden place. Darkness, he made his hidden place. Shesitre Torah, Adam zoche lachem a A person, he merits the sitre. The sitre, which is a hidden place, is aka the hidden mysteries, this orhaganus, this hidden light of the Torah. How do you get it? How do you receive it? Through darkness. And what was darkness? Dark like the concept of black as a raven, darkness. Darkness represents this idea of self-sacrifice. Why? So Rabbi Nachman continues and he says, <laughs> He makes his face as black as a raven. <laughs> For the hidden Torah corresponds to darkness due to its deep concepts. 
look at number 44 in the notes. It says here, the mysteries of the Torah are likened to darkness in that they're hidden from the general knowledge and are not easily understood due to the great death. So darkness is a place, right, where the hidden is hiding, so to speak, right? That's the concept of darkness. Thus he relates, thus he relates, sorry, excuse me. So it says here, this refers to the person who has made his face black by denying himself the physical so as to be worthy of experiencing this Orhaga news. And because of God's chesed, it's saying here in the story, Rabbi Barbarachana was able to pray with intensity and self-sacrifice. And thus he relates that the raven swallowed the aspect of the serpent, meaning the raven, which is the concept of immersing yourself completely into the spiritual world, it swallowed the aspect of the serpent, which represented the physicality. Rabbi Barachana made his face as black as an orin, as black as this raven, and he paid no attention to his physical needs. And this made him worthy of having a taste of the hidden Torah. Rabbi Nachman continues and he says, so, okay, so what is this concept of ascending a tree? What is that all about? And he sat there. So it says here, And this is, it ascended a tree and he sat there. The tree is the dwelling place of the souls. As it says in the Zohar, all the souls, this is a pasuk in the Zohar, all the souls emanate, they come from this great tree. This is the pasuk in the Zohar. So Rabbi Nachman is now telling you it went up to this tree and he sat there. Let's look at number 45. So that concept refers to Bina. We spoke about Bina, which is where the source of, the, of fear from where the neshama in the Zohar, it says that the neshama, the soul comes from this place called Bina. The great tree is an allusion to what, what do we say? It's a tree of life, right? For those that hold on to it, right? Which the Zohar teaches, it corresponds to Bina and to the hidden Torah. This great tree where the souls come from, which is Bina, is really the place where the concept of hidden Torah. That's what this concept of the great tree means, aka it ascended on the tree, it started getting revealed, this hidden Torah. Rabbi Nachman continues, and he says, and the hidden Torah, that's an aspect of the world to come. Look at number 46, guys. The future world, right, we know, the next world that we're going to after 120 years is Olam Haba. It's the world to come. In the teachings of the Arizal, which just passed his yard site, this name is explained as a reference to the revelation of Mochin. Mochin, our concept of mentalities, it's, it's, it's Da'at that's being transmitted down to us, which are in a constant state of coming. They're coming. These ideas are coming. Can you catch them? If God is sending you messages in Torah, are you able to receive it? This is the concept of mentalities, of mochin. In the future world, there will be a continuous revelation of these mochin. We're going to be constantly getting these mentalities coming down, information like we're going to download constantly, right? Whereas presently in this world, only those who are allowed to taste of the hidden Torah acquire these mochin. If you're all into the hidden Torah, if you're receiving it, you're getting these mentalities, you're getting dot, you're getting this divine knowledge that's being brought down to you. In addition of the 10 sphera, the lower seven are associated with the seven days of the week. Whereas Bina, which represents the hidden Torah, that's the eighth, that's the eighth sphera. And the eighth sphera is associated as Ari says, with Olam Haba. So we're trying to bring a lot of connections here of the future world connected to Bina, connected to hidden Torah, hidden secrets. A lot of ideas, Kabbalistic ideas. So basic, in other words, when one has acquired revealed Torah, which is part of the equation, you got to get the revealed Torah, and then you now can pray intensely, and that with self-sacrifice, he merits having the Torah's mysteries revealed to him. And this hidden Torah is synonymous with the world to come when the binds of corporal reality will be shed entirely. In Olam Abba, you are just a soul. 
you have no more physicality tying you down, bringing you down, so to speak, and not letting you completely be who you really are. That's the battle that we have to deal with in this world. But that's the concept of the hidden Torah, which is synonymous with Alam Haba, which means complete no materialism, all in spirituality. <clears throat> so Rabbi Nachman now brings a puzzle from Ishayahu. And first of all, it says, the world to come is an aspect in which there is length of days. Shasham arichot yamim. Moshe Katavot says in Yishayahu, Ki as the days of a tree, so shall the days of my people be. Rabbi Nachman is bringing you this pasuk again, talking about a tree and ex extension, this idea of length of days. How do we get that? How do we do that? So Rabbi Nachman says, Vize, Vize tfila. This is merited through prayer. Ki hakadosh baruchu, for the Holy One. Mit ave litfidatan shel Israel. The Holy One desires the prayers of the Jewish people. Look at number 47 and notes number 47. It says, the Talmud explains this as God's desiring the prayers of specific tzaddikim. God loves the prayers of tzaddikim. But in our context, Rabbi Nachman is explaining this to the prayers of one who is literally living in tzaddik mode, right? He's attained such a degree of humility <clears throat> that he has successfully nullified his own being. He's nothing. His prayers, like those of one with a broken and contrite heart, are the prayers of the tzaddikim. Meaning, Hashem loves the prayer, those prayers. A person who is all into the spirituality and is asking just to be close to him, and he's totally humble, and he negates himself completely, Hashem loves that, right? And he's bringing you a pasuk to show you that. But this part right here coming up is, a, is right now something that you can take home with you right now and pop it into your brain because this is an amazing concept. You're going to think about constantly. Right here. And when the Jews pray before him and they satisfy his desire, Hashem's desire, as I nasek b'yakol b'chinat isha, then God, as it were, he takes on this aspect. He, so to speak, becomes an Isha. Isha means a woman. This feminine characteristic. It is, this is because he receives pleasure from us. When we pray, Hashem receives, so to speak, pleasure from us. Moshe Katub, as there's a Pasuk in Bamidbar, very famous saying that we say in the mornings when we say the korbanot, Ishei reach nichoach Lashem. What does that mean? The pasuk literally means it is an ishe, a fire offering, an appeasing fragrance to God. So Rabbi Nachman takes this pasuk and he breaks it apart and he says, Ayudea reach nichoach shemekabo nase bebechinat isha. So he says here, through the appeasing fragrance, it's a, it says the Pasuk is, it is a fire offering, which means Ishe, an appeasing fragrance to God. So it says here, through the appeasing fragrance that he receives, he takes on the feminine aspect. What does that mean? Look at number 48 on the notes, right? And this is a very incredible concept. Every creation falls into two categories. There's either going to be a mashpiach, which is the giver, usually characterized by the masculine principle, he's the giver, or the nishpa, which is the receiver, the feminine principle. So vis-a-vis -vis the Holy One, Hashem, all aspects of creation are beneficiaries. We are normally the ones, we are the receivers, and God is the giver. He's always the giver, and we are the receivers. So it says here, and nevertheless, so it says here, when the Jewish people perform the mitzvot, we provide God with pleasure. Then when we then we become the mashpiach, we are now the givers, and he is the nishpa, he's the receiver. And this is alluded to in the verse. Look at the verse. It says, I pointed out to you in Hebrew, so you can look at it. Ishe, which means isha, 
woman, feministic characteristic, reach nicholak la Hashem, a pleasant fragrance to God. So when God gets this pleasant fragrance, he turns into, so to speak, this feminine characteristic of an Isha, which means he's now receiving the benefit. So therefore, through our giving and his receiving, God, so to speak, takes on this quality of an Isha, this feminine aspect. Okay. <clears throat> So it says here, and because he brings the Pasuk, he says, the female shall court the male. So it's first, through the appeasing fragrance that he receives, he takes on the feminine aspect. And then it says, there's another Pasuk he's bringing from the book of Jeremiah from Yimriyahu, and he says, the female shall court the male. What does that mean? Look at number 49. Although the present custom that we know is for the male to take the active role, the man has to look for the marriage partner. Right? That's usually how it goes. There's going to come a time, says the prophet Yirmiyahu, when this is going to be reversed. The woman is going to court the man. That's where this passage comes from. The woman shall court the man. In our context, this relates to when God becomes the beneficiary. Now God, so to speak, the tables have turned and now God is receiving the benefit from us. We're the man, he's the woman, so to speak. Then he, as it were, courts the man who through self-sacrifice and intense prayer has provided God with pleasure. So the question here, it says, how does God court man? How does the female court the male? How does God court man? You ready? He reveals himself to him, right? Logically, think about the, a dating scene, right? Uh, whatever. Eventually, you find the, 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 the shidduch and you get married. What happens? He reveals himself to him. Rabbi Nachman deduces from the verse. The word translated as court. Look at the word here. I'll show it to you here so you guys can see it in Hebrew. Right here. This is called tesobev. Tesobev literally means sobev, which means to envelop. It surrounds you, okay? This is what, what Rabbi Nachman is trying to bring down here. The courting means he's Hashem. That's how he, he courts you. He starts surrounding you and enveloping around you, right? And this alludes to this concept of a garment, which the Holy One adorns in order to reveal himself to the one he is courting. Hashem starts surrounding you. Can you imagine? He's always surrounding you, but really it's more of like a concept of understanding of a feeling of an understanding of receiving this divine light. <clears throat> Rabbi Nachman continues and he says, It says, in other words, that aspect which was originally hidden is now revealed through Torah. Before, I didn't feel the light. I didn't feel the surrounding. I didn't get that. Now, through prayer, this intense spiritual prayer that a person's totally immersed in, now I receive it. I get it. The kucha brichu ve'oraita kolachat. And we know, and God, and there's a pasuk in the Zohar that says, God and the Torah are one. That's a pasuk in the Zohar, Right? So it says here that now when God is revealed, what does that really mean? The hidden Torah is revealed. You're receiving this hidden Torah. Thus through prayer, this intense prayer, the Torah is revealed, a.k.a. the hidden mysteries of the Torah, which is amazing. The last part of the story says, Tachazi Kama, Come and see how great was the strength of this tree. That's how the story finishes. That is, come see how great is the strength of those mysteries of the Torah. Because remember, that's what the tree represented. It represented the mysteries of the Torah. It cannot be clothed in anything finite or physical. But only in the one who makes his face as black as a raven 
and behaves as a raven to his children. Now, we look at number 51 to sum that whole story up. Rabbi Nachman taught that when one transcends earthly interests and attachments, he grasps, he grasps completely the entire Torah. And he won't forget what he's learned, which, by the way, right, which, which we're going to just talk about right now, is something common. We learn something, we forget it. Why? Because his incorporeality enables him to encompass the limitless spirituality of the Torah. Meaning, when a person's all in spiritual, whatever you're learning, you're going to be able to now start internalizing it. It's a part of you, right? The Torah is a, is a spiritual thing. And if I'm a spiritual being who's totally immersed in that, it's a lot easier for me to come, come not, not only learn it, but retain it. But it says here, but when one brings corporate reality, when one brings materialism to the words of Torah and causes it to take on this physicality, he was only going to be able to grasp certain aspects of the Torah, never the full thing, never its entirety. And if he attempts to absorb new understanding in his limited mind, he's going to find that a response the way to anything physical would when it's full, meaning when a person is on the materialistic learning side, so to speak, it's almost like I'm learning a science, something in science or social studies or history or whatever it might be. It's like, so to speak, another subject. Sometimes we learn something and whatever was in here in the brain just leaves. And now you like got new knowledge. Okay. But you don't retain sometimes everything. You can't retain everything. It's very hard. Your brain can't, is not capable of doing these things. So in this lesson, now we're going to finish up a, a, a part about this lesson that is very interesting. Because if you look at the story at the end, if you look at the beginning, beginning of the whole story, it said, the last Pesach said, Rabbi Papa, the son of Shmuel said, this is the last part of Rabbi, Rabbi Baba Ratra's story. Rabbi Papa, the son of Shmuel said, had I not been there, I would never have believed him. That's the last part of the story. But Rabbi Nachman doesn't put that in the story. So there's no explanation to that last sentence. So we find that the, the Sherin or Rav, who was the Parpar of the Chachma, who was one of the main commentators of Likutei Maharan, a very great, great rabbi in the Breslin tradition, he brought down an incredible insight that brought that idea home that ties it perfectly with everything that we're talking about. So it says here, and the Trina Rav said, there's no evidence that Rabbi Nachman said this, but he offered this interpretation, which is amazing. He said, the Talmud t tells us, what was Rabbi, Rabbi, Pap, Rabbi Papa? What was, what was his position? He was the Dayan. He was the judge in the city of Pompadita. Okay, Masechah Sanhedrin says that. He was a judge. In our context, right, we learned, this alludes to the practicing of people that do it. Why? Right, because we're constantly elevating fear to its source by instituting justice. How do we institute justice? By doing people to do it and, and literally judging ourselves on all our wrongs, right? That's the concept of being a judge, judging yourself. So he said, had I not been there, meaning had I not been there, meaning practicing, if I wasn't practicing justice, I would never have believed him that there is, exists this akrukta, that it exists this frog that's like huge he would never have believed rabbi barbarana that's possible to elevate fear to its source the dot and thereby attain, attain this revealed torah and the ability to pray intensely and then when a person prays intensely then you're going to get revelations of the hidden torah and all this was accomplished how through Hibodidut, through the concept of judgment and that last line brought it home even though rabbi nachman didn't say it the commentary brings it home he was a judge and he says, if I didn't know, if I didn't understand the concept of judging, because this is what I did every single day, I would never would have believed Rabbi Babar Khan. But because of the fact that I am a judge, I totally understand everything he's talking about. Amazing. Great way of actually finishing the story. Now we continue. And it probably, yeah, let's see how much we can. Yeah, we might be able to get this done, guys. I'm so excited. Okay, cool. Here we go. So now we're on 15.6. Another amazing, boombastic, Rabbi Nachman fire Torah that is just incredible because he ties it perfectly with this lesson. So now he brings down a Pasuk in Pirkei Avot. I'll read it to you in English, and then we'll go through it as we, we go through this thing. So it says like this. There are five possessions 
which the Holy One acquired in his world. One possession is Torah. The Holy One acquired in his world, Torah. Heaven and earth are another possession. Abraham is another possession. Israel, the Jewish people, is one possession. And the Holy Temple is one possession. Five different possessions that the Holy One acquired in his world. Rabbi Nachman is about to break this down and explain to you how to completely, completely relates to everything we're learning. Here we go. And this corresponds to the five possessions which we acquired in this world. Torah Kenyan Echad. Torah is one possession. And this corresponds to the concept of revealed Torah. Right? We, we bring the, the fear up to the top, to the Bina, right? And now we're getting this revealed Torah. Torah. That's one possession. Shemaim ve'aretz kinyan echad. And heaven and earth is another possession. And zeh bechina talat ha'ir l'da. This is the aspect of elevating the sphere to dat, to knowledge. Eretz, earth, zeh bechina t'ira kena. Earth corresponds to fear. We learned earlier in this chapter that there was a pasuk that explained that earth was fear by using two different words together. Okay? So earth represents fear. And heaven, that corresponds to da'at. That corresponds to knowledge. Because da'at, because knowledge, da'at is a concept of union. How do we know that? Because he brings you a pasuk from Breshi, and he says, "Behadam yada." The man, when when man Adam, as in the character Adam, he knew Chava, his wife. That's how he says it. Basically, he had relations with his wife, and the concept was he knew his wife. That's the concept of dot, dot, aka a union. When you know. That's the concept of dot equals unison, right? Look how amazing this is. Bezebechinat shamayim. Shamayim is actually composed of two different words. Esh, which is fire. Umayim, which is water. Mechuvarin yachad. Heaven. And sorry, heaven is composed of esh, which is fire. And Mayim, which is water, you put them together, you unify them, they become one. That's the concept of a union. That's the concept of Da'at, which is knowledge, which is what Rabbi Nachman was trying to bring down to you. Earth corresponds to fear. And the concept that we need to raise the fear to your knowledge, to Da'at. Heaven and earth are one possession. That is what that concept means, which is one of the main concepts of Rabbi Nachman's teaching in this Torah. Third one, Abraham, Abraham, Kinyan Echad. Abraham is another possession. Zebechina Tefillah. This corresponds to prayer. Bechina Shitin Bate, Shishim Hema Melacho. The aspect of the 60 houses, which we spoke about, which are the 60 kingdoms as we spoke about, right? Abraham represented this concept of kindness. Abraham represented this concept of prayer. We learned about this earlier in this lesson. So I can't go ahead and go and repeat everything again, but just the idea that we have to know is Abraham represented that concept. We learned that. The 60 kingdoms corresponds to the concept of prayer. So there you go. Another concept of the three possessions, Abraham, that relates to the concept of prayer, which really means the prayer of the shedding off all materialistic and having an intense, intense prayer. He continues and he says, Israel, Kenyan, Echa. Israel is one other possession. Zebechinan Mishpat Hamalat Ayira. And this is the aspect of judgment, which elevates fear, right? Judgment, judging yourself through Hibodadud, that elevates the fear. As explained, as it says in the Pasuk of Tehillim, Chukav Mishpatav Israel. The Pasuk here in Tehillim says, Mishpat, judgment, next to the word Israel. And as we've learned many times before, for all my Likutei Moharan junkies, we have to know 
that when we have two words that are together, there is a connection. You can actually plug and play. Israel equals justice. Oh, okay. Therefore, that being said, if Israel is symbolic of judgment, right? We know that that's how fear is elevated to the source by judging yourself. That's why Israel is another possession because that's the concept of every, all the ideas that we've been learning about. That when a person judges himself, he does he for the dude, he raises fear all the way up to the source. <clears throat> the last part here says, Beit HaMikdash, the holy temple, Kenyan Echad, and holy temple is another possession. What does a holy temple represent? This corresponds to the mysteries of the Torah. Which are merited through prayer. The aspect of Abraham. The mysteries of the Torah, which are merited through prayer. That's the concept of Abraham, right? Because Abraham represents this concept of prayer, right? Who is the Ish Chesed. Chesed. Abraham is on the right-hand side. He's a man of kindness. And now Rabbi Nachman continues and he says like this. In English, it is this mountain, which his right hand has acquired. What's right hand? Right hand is your chesed. On the, on the concept of spirot, chesed is represented by your right hand, which is the giving hand, which is kindness, right? So now Rabbi Rachman says, Shezei yamin, bechinat Right corresponds to prayer, which is the aspect of Abraham. Benikra har al shem omek hamusak. And the hidden Torah is also called the mountain due to its deep concepts, right? The idea of the hidden Torah, which is, we spoke about the idea that it's something that you can, you, it's dark, right? You find it in the darkness. It's very hidden, right? They also call that a mountain, which is a, a uh, trying to connect it to the concept of the Holy Temple, which the Holy Temple was actually on the mountain, a harbite, right? That's what they say. It's all going up the mountain, a very holy mountain, right? That's the concept of the hidden Torah because of its deep, deep concepts. Look at number 59. The hidden Torah corresponds to darkness. Its mysteries have great depth and cannot be easily understood. Therefore, it says this mountain the deep and hidden Torah, which his right hand prayer has acquired. The Pasuk is this mountain, which his right hand has acquired. The mountain represents the concept of deep, deep hidden Torah and his right hand, which how did you get that hidden Torah? How do we get it? Through intense, intense prayer. Benikra Beit HaMikdash. And that's why it's also called the Holy Temple, which we spoke about as one of the possessions. Bechinat Kodesh, the Holy Temple is the aspect of holiness. Bechinat Reishi, which is the concept also of the first. So we see in number 60, Israel is holy to God, the first fruits of his produce, is the Pasuk in Yerim Holiness is connected with the concept, it's synonymous with the first. The first fruits are the ones that are the holy. The firstborn is always the holiest. The first in divine thought, the Jewish people were first in divine thought, holy. First, first, first equals holy. Okay? And then he says, behold, Zarlo Yakol Kodesh. No non priest may eat that which is holy. Look at this. Amazing. Look at 61 in the notes. It's forbidden for someone who is not a Kohen. These are rules, the rules of Beit HaMikdash and all the different things that they were going on back in the day. It's for, forbidden for someone who is not a Kohen, who is not a priest, to eat from the sacrifices of the temple. In the context of this lesson, Rabbi Nachman teaches that only the holy, a.k.a. this priest, a.k.a. this man of chesed, this Abraham-like figure, he, which represents this concept of getting rid of all your physicality, he can partake of the Torah's mysteries. However, a person who has not attained that level of intense prayer, he won't be able to partake of the holy, this or haganus, this hidden light. So when he brings you the prospect that says, no non-priest may eat that which is holy, like the holy temple, 
it means the holiness, the holiness regarding the concept of the Or Haganus, this hidden light, not everybody can have it. You got to be a priest, aka, you got to be a really holy individual who is all in on spirituality. Rabbi Nachman continues, he says, Velo Yachobo, Ela Mikdushav Umikorov. So it says here, the only ones that may eat of it are, are his holy ones. Right. So it says here, the ones who can eat it are the only holy ones and those whom we call to partake. And the holy temple corresponds to the mysteries of the Torah. So the holy temple, which is the concept of holiness, not everybody, as I mentioned earlier, not everybody can partake of this. Not everybody can have it. Which is amazing. He's just bringing you five different things that God has possessions of and how all those specific ones relate specifically with the whole Torah of everything he's trying to explain. Unbelievable. And we have six minutes left. And I think considering the circumstances, I think I'm going to stop because we have six minutes left into the next class and we're almost, almost finished. But Bezrat Hashem, what we're gonna do next week is we'll finish off the chapter and then we are going to start a new chapter and Bezrat Hashem it should be a big one my Jewish birthday again falls on next Tuesday night not a coincidence and therefore it should be filled with a lot of holiness and Kedusha and everybody can get brachas for me because I'll be firing away after learning Torah like this you want to get brachas right away so uh, Bezrat Hashem that would be amazing I am going to now quickly open up the floor here to those that want to partake and say something specifically, hold on a second. All right, if you guys wanna unmute yourself, feel free to jump in before the next class. Who do I see here also? Let's see here. What's up, Josh? Wow, that's amazing. Sharon Lankry, you better unmute yourself right now. <laughs> Hello. Wow, guys, we're about to have a holy conversation. Not very often do you get to see me and Sharon talk with each other, but usually back in the day when we were in the Lighthouse Project, it would be me and Sharon talking for another hour after the night is over, discussing back and forth Torah concepts and ideas and what's going on. And oh, I miss those times. Sharon, how are you, brother? Let's go. Throw, throw it up in the air. Let's go. What are we talking about? <laughs> Michael, I, I didn't realize you were going to double book this. I did. I would have come. I didn't know that it was it was one after the other. I thought that it was either you or Sharon. So, I know, I know. I'm sorry. For, for those that are watching right now on Facebook, the live stream is about to finish. You can watch this class uh, anytime you want on the Facebook or on the uh, YouTube account. We'll put the links up in the WhatsApp group for those to listen and watch. I will stop it here. And for those that are staying 